I'm David Mickey Evans. I'm a screenwriter director. And uh, talking to my friend Dante Luna. And uh, I guess I'm best known for a movie called The Sandlot. Co wrote it, directed it, and I narrated it. That's my voice on that picture. Seems like uh, a lifetime ago, but it also seems like it was yesterday. It's based on um, an incident from my childhood when my little brother jumped over a fence on our block where we lived to get a baseball and a big dog, literally named Hercules, bit him. Bit him really bad. And uh, a bunch of bullies on our street laughed at him because they thought that was real funny. And that uh, incident just occurred to me one day uh, as I was driving. And I said, man, that's a, that's, a, that's a good movie, but who wants to see a movie about a bunch of bullies laughing at some poor little kid? And so in a nutshell, I turned all the bullies into heroes. And uh, sort of wrote itself after I uh, figured that out. My name is Marshall Moore. I'm Vice President of Marketing and Operations for Utah Film Studios. I'm also the co-chair for the 25th anniversary uh, celebration of the Sandlot uh, being filmed in Utah. Yeah, we're in the community of Glendale. It's a, an int a intimate neighborhood on the west side of Salt Lake. Um, Sandlot was filmed here 26 years ago because they actually filmed the year before the movie was, was released. We're on a street called Navajo Street. And uh, it's just a bunch of middle-class houses uh, where these neighbors live. And this is kind of the area of the Sandlot. This is the only place you can really enter. So this is it, the Sandlot. Um, you know, it is, <laughs> it's a great place to do the movie for sure. Uh, it's kind of intimate, surrounded by homes, as you can see. But it's just a field. It's a field of weeds brought to life by the kids that played ball here in the movie. <laughs> the beast, the beast. Yeah. yeah, he's a little beast. Awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Nice. Did you ever see the movie? Man, we just love it. No, we just cool. loved it. So, and I think a lot of people come by to take pictures of the of the summer yeah. lot. Yeah. The original title of the script was "The Boys of Summer," um, which I thought was a great title. But it turns out that a great sports writer by the name of Roger Kahn had a book called "The Boys of Summer," so we ended up not being able to use that title. And then uh, when we were editing it. Uh, me and Fox, the studio, you know, went round and round with all sorts of different titles and, you know, simple is always better, you know, most of the time. And so after we cut the picture together, the, the word and the name, the Sandlot was mentioned, um, you know, a lot of times in the movie, the, the boys, the characters say it. So it just seemed, uh, seemed like a no brainer to call it the Sandlot. So for people who've never met you before, introduce yourself. What's your name? And, um, you know, where are we right now? Scott Evans, I am a 53-year-old grandfather of five, and we are standing on the original Sandlot set, the original Sandlot. This is where the movie was filmed, baseball scenes. Can you tell me the story about when you went over the fence? Um, you know, what exactly happened that day? So we were bullied as little kids because we were in a new neighborhood moving into a little area called Pacoima, California, north, uh, about 15 minutes north of downtown Los Angeles. We just moved in and we were told to go out and make friends. So we walked out the door and there was a bunch of noise and kids sound like they're having a great time way up the street to the left. So I went over there and my brother, oddly, he's two and a half years older than me, so oddly, he didn't go with me. He just went straight down the sidewalk. So the, uh, the ball was pitched and uh, I wasn't playing that particular game, but I was on the sidelines. So the ball was pitched, the ball was hit and the ball landed in the backyard protected by a big dog. The actual dog was a German Shepherd Doberman Pinscher mix. But at eight years old, everything looks big. So we all peeked over the wall and I said, I'll get it because that was the last ball we had. We were all poor and I was kind of being bullied. So I didn't, I, I said, I'll get it because I can save the day because once the ball is gone, the, ga the, the game is gone. So they laced their fingers together, boosted me up the wall. I landed in the backyard and the dog was chained up and the ball literally was about three inches from the dog's nose. But I said, well, the dog can't get it, so the dog can't get me. Went over, I leaned with my right hand, I grabbed the ball, it was all slobbery, just like you saw in the movie. I turned around, all the guys are watching me, and they saw what I didn't see. They saw the chain break, and they screamed, run, and then they dropped out of sight. There was a tree, kind of like a Dr. Zeus, kind of weird, crooked, growing tree with a bottom branch cut off. So I ran for that tree. I planted my left foot in that tree. 
I reached up for the wall and the dog launched and grabbed me on the left leg. While I was stumbling home, somebody had gone and talked to my mom and told her what was happening. She drove up in the 1972 VW van, white on beige, sliding doors open and into the van and off to the hospital. What's up, my name's Patrick Renna. I uh, play Ham Porter in the Sandlot. Thank you, Vic, that's Victor DiMattia. He plays uh, Timmy Timmons. What do we got? We got Grant Gelt. We got uh, Shane Obazinski. We got Marty York. We got Will Horniff. We got Brandon Adams. We got the whole gang here. Did I miss someone? Oh, you're killing me, Smalls. I forgot you. I'm sorry. <laughs> we got Tom Guyrie. Uh, only the star of the movie. The star of the oh, Sandlot. One of the most famous lines ever uttered in movie history, right? Yeah. yeah. By the great Hambino to this guy right here 25 years ago. You know what it was? You're One, two, three. You're killing me, Smalls. I, I like it when everyone says it. That's really cool, man. I, I, I hear it a lot, though. All right, I like it. Have fun. Sandlot movie, 25 years celebration here at the uh, yeah, Thank you. 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 I'm about to throw this heater out there. Semi heater. I mean, I ain't even going front. It's gonna... <laughs> I ain't even going front. It's going to be lukewarm. <laughs> as long as I don't 50 cent it. Shout out to 50. To New Year's and Porter. I like it. It's got a little heat on it. I like it. It ain't the heater, but I like it. You don't need one. No, I'm just playing. I don't know. <laughs> oh, this is four. We decided not to shoot it in Los Angeles, which is sort of where it took place in the northeastern San Fernando Valley because it was too expensive, um, traffic, this, that, and the other thing. The only other place in the world that looks like the Los Angeles Basin and San Fernando Valley, which has purple mountains all around it, is Salt Lake City, Utah. It's at a higher elevation. In uh, San Fernando, they have the San Gregorio Mountains that go all, all the way around in, and up to the Sierras. but. In uh, Salt Lake City, it's called the Wasatch Mountains. So we said, all right, let's go there. Plus, it was a right to work state. You know, people have a great work ethic. It was uh, less expensive to shoot it there. So we did a bunch of uh, location scouting there, looked at a, a bunch of elementary schools, didn't, didn't, didn't feel right. Then we went and looked at a bunch of uh, Little League fields, which was, eh, it was better, but still not. And my, my production designer, uh, Chester Kaczynski, goes, you know, we just got to find some place and build this, you know. and, and we'll look around the older sections of Salt Lake and see if we can find some land that has some older 50s or 60s looking homes. And he found that in no time. The reason that is still there and it probably always will be is because that little couple of acres of land is owned uh, in concert with all the homeowners around there. For some reason, they all have a, a piece of that land, but never, never, nobody ever did anything with it. So, you know, we made a deal with them. There was no tree there. There was no houses. Uh, you know, no Timmons house, no. So everything you see, we built. Um, the Timmons house, the backyard, the fences, the phone poles that you see, the sand lot, uh, Mr. Myrtle's house, all that stuff we, we built. I'm Jackie Nielsen, and uh, this is my home. And this is where the sand lot was uh, shot partially. And uh, Benny the Jet lived in my house. And uh, it was very enjoyable. We found that block, and all those houses had that, you know, uh, 50s suburban three plus two ranch house vibe, you know? So it was pretty, pretty easy to make that decision. Plus those houses are catty cornered each other. So filmically, it worked perfect. I think we shot there for about a week or something. The, 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 the house that, we, that you see that, that Scotty is sitting outside of is not the house we shot the interiors in though. The interiors were shot in a house down the street because it had a better layout for us or whatnot. 
And I don't think we ever went into, there was actually a scene in the original script written uh, for the boys to be at Benny's house watching a Dodger game or something like that. And they see Maury Wills st steal a base and all that. But we never got around to it. And we, had to we had to cut it out. Mike Vitar, Benny, look, there's a little something nobody really knows. When, when my little brother and I, we got beat up at home. We got bullied and beat up on the way to school. We got beat up at school. We got beat up on the way back from school. And then we went home and got beat up. Okay. And that's the way it was. In the early 70s, when we lived in the San Fernando Valley, Sandlot takes place in 62 for an entirely different reason, but 72 when we were growing up, we were two of the only little Caucasian kids in a three or four block area, okay? Most of the kids uh, were Chicano, and where we went to elementary school and, and uh, junior high, same thing. When we wrote the script, when I reimagined that idea, and I said I turned all of those uh, bullies from my childhood into heroes, um, he became a really important character and figure for me, right? Because he's the hero, you know? But he's sort of ethnically, you know, uh, the guys that treated me very badly, that was a very cathartic thing for me. I got over a lot of hatred. I mean, you know, those guys, man, up in my, my, my uh, early adulthood, they were taking up a lot of space in my head, you know? And that was a way for me to forgive them. I'll never forget them. Forgive them, get on with it, and, and turn uh, my bullies into this one legendary hero. Not quite sure what Freud would say about that, but I really don't care, you know? Um, but Mike, listen, Mike was, uh, yes, he was as good looking in person as he is in the movie. He's really blessed. He's a beautiful human being, and he was, he did all his own stunts, all his own, except for jumping off the fence, that was a stunt man, but everything else he did, and every baseball he hit in that movie, he actually hit that ball, he was really that good. I mean, if he'd have played baseball through college or whatever, I bet you he could have made the majors. And he, um, and he in, in real life and off camera was, and this was a blessing for a director as well, he really was kind of the, uh, the boss, the general, of all the guys. They all looked up to him, you know, uh, and they all became fast friends. So, yeah, and he was the very first kid of thousands and thousands that I ever interviewed to be in that movie. He was the very first kid I ever saw. There's been some movies over time that have been filmed in Utah, but not a lot of them where people were able to really identify with and say, wow, that was, um, you know, that, that's homegrown here, and that's up to the Sandlot, um, and it's become really kind of a cult classic film. And having that, you know, some some of the quotes and things in the movie the Sandlot. I obviously you still hear people saying today, you know, you're killing me, Smalls, or whatever it may be from the film. And uh, you know, it's it's uh, something that really we take a lot of pride in. You know, I also uh, found out later after after several years after the film came out that that the uh, I guess the swimming pool in the in the uh, film was filmed at Lauren Farr Park, which is my great-great-grandfather, it was Lauren Farr, and so it was named after him. And so they have a little bit of uh, uh, association with it that way too. Ah, uh, Wendy. <laughs> um, Marley was, the, she, first of all, she was a total pro. I think she was 17 or 18 when, when we made the picture. And I never told the guys who was gonna play Wendy Peppercorn, and I never let them see a picture or, or introduce until the day we shot that stuff, dude. So when you see, when you see Chauncey, you know, uh, he's seeing her walking down the street, man. That's pretty much the first time he saw her. And, and then uh, she was a total trooper, totally professional, totally game to, to you know, ham it up you know, with the well, oceaning and the oiling and all that. Absolute pro. She's had a tremendous career. And I think, I think if memory serves, Chauncey was like really, really nervous for weeks about doing that scene. He constantly badgering me, like, we're gonna do that scene now? You know, you know when, I, when I kiss a lot of guards, so what do you think we're gonna do that scene today, Mr. Evans? So what are we gonna do tomorrow? We're gonna do that scene? It goes on and on and on, and finally the day arrives, and I go, all right, listen, you know, we're gonna do that scene. So uh, I took him aside, and, and I said, and he's, I could tell he was just, you know, crapping himself, he was so nervous. But he's really anxious to do it. And I said, dude, I only have one direction for you. And I said, you keep your tongue in your mouth, pal. <laughs> he's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I, I know, I know, man. He's trying to pretend he's cool. So they do. We got in the first take, you know, and it just was pitch perfect. The timing was perfect. And that little, that little dude goes, 
uh, I, I, I don't know, Dave. I, can we do another one? You know, the way we shot it, it just felt very realistic, as if we were, I was really a lifeguard at a local swimming pool, and Chauncey and the rest of those guys are such good actors, and I remember we only got one shot to do the dive, because then I would be sopping wet, and it would you know, take forever to get dry. And I, when I watch the movie, I laugh because it's like the worst dive. My legs are, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not a very pretty dive, but, you know, I did rescue the kid. It's incredible to see the legacy that it's left and how people just have really embraced this movie. And it seems to just stand the test of time, and it's just an honor to be a part of it. It was cold. Really, really cold. Extremely cold. That's why I'm shivering. I remember being excited and nervous and waiting for that kiss for all my life up to that point, right? You know, normally I don't wear glasses, I have perfect vision, but the effect of squints is, is missed without the glasses. I mean, it's like such an iconic thing, so. I put them on and for the fans, for the pictures, because uh, just seeing me with the glasses and the hat like makes, makes it all different, you know? They get to smile and have that moment, and that's what it's all about. <laughs> hey, what's up, man? Dude, I love this board. <laughs> Can you go above your I want watch this the board. other signatures? Can you go above your, above your name? Yeah. So the nickname is kind of watch the other names on there because the paint's not dry. Oh, yeah. You should be good. Yeah, you should be good. Those ones are signed. It's the official DGK Dirty Ghetto Kids uh, Sandlot deck. Uh, it's special to me because I have uh, skateboarded pretty much my whole life, and baseball is my favorite sport. So two and two goes hand in hand. We drove from Rochester, New York, so six hours away um, when uh, up, down, up, down on the uh, pattern there to kind of keep it even. So just got to get Benny the jet at some point, and uh, it's going to be complete. Start it off. Anywhere? Anywhere. <laughs> Fresh. So what up, Marshall? Good How are you, it. man? Good yeah. to see you. What's your name, bud? Nico? I like that. That's a my good name. Ma my mom says I'm you in the movie. You are. You look, you look just like me. Yeah. Oh, he's got the PF Flyers on. I got mine That's on, right. too. That's right, yeah. PF Flyers are like this, man. When we were kids, we were very poor. Uh, poorer than most of the other kids we knew. And um, in school and all that. I mean, you know, it, my, we just we struggled. And um, we never had really nice uh, shoes. I mean, we had, like... There was like a store like White Front, which is sort of like the target of its day, but really down low, down rent, man, you know. Uh, and we would go, if we could afford it, if my own mom could afford it, to get school shoes for the, you know, you'll get a couple of pieces, a couple of shirts, a couple of jeans, whatever. And we always had to get those, you know, $2.99 plain wrap uh, tennis shoes you know which wore out in like a month but then we'd have to tape them up and wear them anyway and stuff and uh, I always remembered hearing and seeing on TV during cartoons and whatnot PF flyers you know shoes guaranteed to make a kid run faster and jump higher and dude we believed that we literally believed that if we ever got a pair of PF flyers we would run faster than anyone they were like magic like magic shoes and uh I do not believe that we ever actually got a pair. Might have gotten a pair of Chuck Taylors, but usually it was just the cheapest things uh, we could find. So when it came time for Benny to, uh, to jump that fence, this is the only piece of childhood he's taking with him. Because that fence in the sandlot is a metaphor. Uh, it's the metaphorical dividing line between childhood and adulthood, right? So when he leaves the sandlot and jumps over that fence, he's He's taking on an obligation and responsibility and all that stuff that comes with having to grow up, right? But this is, this is the only piece of childhood he takes with him, is, are these shoes guaranteed to make a kid run faster and jump higher. So it was a no-brainer, you know? Because Chuck Taylors were cool back in the day, but they weren't like these. These. These were the best ones. <laughs> But we gotta get the You're very welcome. We gotta get the program rolling. Oh, oh, uh, it wasn't? No, it is. It's like, you know, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs>
characters and maybe is their actor names but I'll introduce them as they come up first let's have Pat Renna let's hear it for Pat Renna Hamilton Porter the great Hambino <laughs> okay next in line there Grant Gelt Bertram Bertram Grover Weeks Big Chief the best we got him next in line we have Brandon Adams, De Nunez. He can throw the heater. <laughs> he still can. He, he threw one last night at the Bees game, if you guys were there. All right. And here's the, here's the dark horse in our favorite Sandlot uh, character, uh, uh, cast, cast character, is uh, Marty York. Yeah, yeah. Let's hear it for yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he looks pretty crappy. He looks pretty good, but, well, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the guy with the glasses is next. Let's give it up for Chauncey Leopardi. Squints. He just came in today. Glad to have him. He was here five years ago as well. <laughs> you guys have to come up together? <laughs> They're brothers. You know them as... Timmy and Tommy Timmons, Timmy and Tommy Repeat Timmons, Victor Dematia, and Shane Obedzinski. They travel everywhere together. And now, I gotta be honest, I'm pretty excited about this one. I said I did not want to do this event unless this guy came. Five years ago, we wanted him to come. We didn't work it out, probably our fault, not his. But um, he's here with us tonight. He was probably the most asked about where is so-and-so when he wasn't here. But I said, guys, at the top of our list this year to bring back along with the guys that came before is Tom Guyry, Smalls. Some call him the star of the movie. Let's give it up for Tom Guyry, Scotty Smalls. You're killing me, right? Shane Obazinski, I played Tommy Repeat Simmons. What do you remember about being casted for this film? It was actually kind of a, I don't want to say a nightmare, but I live in Central Florida, so we, uh, Miami is about a four hour drive. We drove to Miami to audition. When we got back, this is the day of fax machines and like, you know, voice machines. So we got back with a fax waiting for us on the machine that said we got a call back. So I don't even think we unpacked. We just turned around and drove back to Miami. Uh, I, remember, I remember a 30 second audition, if not less. So I felt awful. Uh, came back home, heard nothing for two weeks. Uh, then I got a phone call that said, your ticket's in the mail, you're going to California. And the rest is history. Shane, uh, Shane Obazinski, he was the smallest, littlest kid in the cast. And uh, I think he was only 10 or 11. Might have turned 11 as we were shooting the movie. So the other guys were, you know, there's a big difference between 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, you know, hormones and all that sort of thing. Uh, I really never had to say much to Shane. It was just like, dude, you know, Tommy's gonna say, Timmy's gonna say something and you, and you repeat it. And he just had a great sense of, of comic timing. He was a sweet, sweet kid, and he is to this day. He's just, he's sweet as pie, and I mean that in a really, really complimentary way. In the beginning, we were all trying out for different roles. They were trying to figure out who was going to play who, and there was an age difference originally. They wanted uh, younger kids, and they fired all these young kids. And they got older kids. It was, it was bizarre. Originally, I was reading for Tommy. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, small, uh, Smalls. And um, we tried that for a little bit, and it didn't work, and then... 
repeat came along and that, that's what they thought I was best for. And honestly, that was the easiest for me because it was an easy script. But uh, it was good because I was the youngest, the shortest, and that's the role I needed to fill for, to, to make the movie. So it was, a, it was a pleasure. What do you remember about stepping on this field for the first time? Right back here where you can't, okay, yeah, you can't see. That was my house. That was the, the Timmons house right here. And right behind me directly was where Mr. Myrtle's house was. So when we stepped on the field, I believe we came up from behind the first play, uh, home, home base. There was an alley over here. I know you can't see. I'm pointing. But, and uh, we walked up and we're like, oh, this is pretty cool. And there's these houses and they looked real. You know, we were like, this is, this is where we're going to spend our summer. This is pretty cool. Um, the crazy part is when you come back here 20 years later, and then 25 years later and see what it's turned into. And that's when you get the goosebumps and that's when you make sure your glasses are on so no one knows you're tearing up. Victor. <laughs> Victor, he's another guy that hasn't changed much. That kid had the greatest smile and he was always, he just like, I'm sure he's had a life like the rest of us, but man, he just seems to coast. You know, he's just got one of those like perennially it's like in his jeans, he's always happy and smiling, you know? So he was always a pleasure to be around. He is to this day, he's like that. They interview kids from all over the country, man. So, I mean, it was, it was intense. We did uh, a round, several rounds of callbacks and stuff, and then we, they had us out there playing baseball and everything. It was, it was wild. Just the fact that 25 years later, I mean, it's what you hope for as an actor, you know, that you do something that's going to sustain this long, resonate with people. It's really amazing. It's, you know, it's very humbling that we get so much love everywhere we go. And, you know, fans just come out and line up and wait hours just to, you know, get an autograph or a picture. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's everything that you want to do as an actor. I remember the first time going in the treehouse, and that was really cool. And all the old toys from the period, from the 60s and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that was cool. I remember that for sure. The tree is an interesting story because uh, we had absolutely no idea where the hell we were going to get a tree. We need a really big old oak tree, you know, like 100 years old, 200 years old, something like that. And to buy something like that was many hundreds of thousands of dollars because, you know, the, <laughs> it was a 200-year-old specimen tree, right? We had no, no money like that. And weirdly enough, this is one of these really amazing, you know, kismet moments that happened on that show is... Uh, Chester was coming to work one day early in the morning and he's going by a big uh, uh, a house that, that was had been built 150 200 years ago or something this really old historic home uh, by some Mormon pioneers okay in, in Salt Lake and then there's this giant oak tree next to it like really close to the house and a man was out there starting up a chainsaw he was going to cut it down right this this historic oak and so Chester hit the brakes in the car runs up and goes excuse me excuse me what are you doing he goes, I'm cutting down this tree. You know, it's been here for, you know, however many, 150 years, and it's, it's messing up the foundation of my house. And Chester goes, can I have it? He goes, what, the tree? And the guy goes, yeah, just get it out of here. He goes, well, I'll be back you know, in a few days. So we had to go get two and connect them together, 50-foot flatbed trailers and a big old, you know, truck, uh, semi-rig, call the phone company and the power company and they'd had to take the phone and power lines off the streets that we were going through to get to the sandlot with this gigantic crane so they did all that for us and uh we got a big crane we dug a gigantic hole and put something like oh my god it must have been 15 20 cubic yards of cement in the ground to hold this thing up and then they uh took every leaf off that tree and put on millions and millions of silk leaves so that it would stay green for the entire time that we were shooting the movie. And then around that, they built the, the uh, treehouse and stuff. A lot of stuff like that happened on that movie, man. Great vacuum cleaner explosion of 1993. Uh, I just remember they had like three different makeup artists putting dirt and, you know, it was, it was uh, powder, right? Makeup powder, all the different colors mixed together to look like a dirt kind of thing. And they were stuffing it in my pockets and just, you know, anywhere they could get it so that every time I took a step, there would be that big cloud, you know, coming out. And uh, it worked. It looked, it came across, it looked really good, but it was miserable getting all that stuff clean. Tommy Guyrie. Tommy Guyrie, look, at, first of all, I'm just going to say this up front. Every one of these guys is a solid young man. Well, they're 30-something they're now. But, I mean, when we worked together way back in the day, they were all an absolute blast to work with. They were well behaved when they needed to be well behaved but they were all 12 and 13 so you know it was like herding squirrels you know sometimes but 
Tommy, the thing with Tommy is that uh, when he was not the goof or dork that Scotty Smalls is, when he, that kid was like a black belt in karate in 1992, okay? He was tough as nails. He was from Jay-Z, you know? You wouldn't want to mess with him. But he was such a good listener and a good actor that he, he, he played a dork really well. No way! <laughs> Where'd you get that hat? Really? That's the coolest, man. That's an awesome hat. Don't be a goofball. That's a real hat for a second. That's insane, dude. Well, now you know where to get it. The tongue you tried on? Can I put it on? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, my God. Welcome back. I'm back, baby. <laughs> trout. This looks more like a... Yeah, it's a trout. In uh, the early 70s, my little brother and I, I was probably maybe 10 years old. He was probably 8, maybe 9 and 11, 10 and 8, right, right around in there. <clears throat> so must have been about 1972, 73, something like that. We lived in the northeastern San Fernando Valley, but all of our cousins and aunts and uncles, our, 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 our paternal grandparents, lived back in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey in Point Pleasant, which is a... Well, at the time, I'd never, I haven't been there in many, many, many years. But it was this really cool, right on the ocean, uh, and, and they had canals, you know, where you have uh, houses with a boat dock and stuff like that, like here in Florida. And uh, when we went there, our grandfather was pretty old at the time. He had a little boat, you know, maybe like a little 20-foot day runner boat. And we, my brother and I were there, and our cousin Evan, and I think his little sister. But anyway, and my mom... Uh, drove us back there all the way across country in a 1972 VW bus with a 200 pound St. Bernard. Okay, <laughs> it was hysterical. Uh, we camped at KOA campgrounds and all that. It took a long time to get there because you know those old VWs don't go very fast. Point of the matter is when we got there, our grandfather got us, me and my brother and our cousin, all these super long build fishing caps. And they had these like little trouts or snappers or whatever they were on there. And we just thought we were, you know, frickin' Hemingway, man. We were going to go out and catch marlin and all that kind of crap. And, and we never took these off. And uh, we had them forever. And uh, we caught some fish. We caught a lot of flounder, you know, just bottom feeders and stuff like that. Big ones. And uh, that was one of the best memories my brother and I have of our childhood. And so it's, it's not said in the sandlot, but Scotty's supposed to have moved to the valley from, you know, either Pennsylvania or New Jersey, whatever. So when the time came to talk about his costuming, uh, Grania Preston, my, my uh, costume designer, I told her that story, and I, I said, you got to find me a long-billed fishing cap, and I want you to put a trout on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that when he goes to the sandlot and everybody else has got, like, Boston, KC, L.A., he's got a freaking trout, you know? And, uh, you know... That became a big deal, man. <laughs> a lot of people loved it. My name is Tommy Guyry. Uh, I played Scotty Smalls in The Sandlot. I remember it was a long process. I mean, they were going through a lot of different people. And uh, I think I didn't make the first cut on the screen test, but they brought me back in. And uh, then I, after my second screen test, I got the part. What, what do you remember about stepping foot on, on the field for the first time? I remember thinking it was so big. It was huge. Now, coming back as, uh, as an adult, it doesn't look as big as it was, but it brought back a lot of memories, you know, and, and it was kind of surreal coming back after 25 years. I don't think we ever thought that we, we'd, you know, we never thought that this movie was going to make the kind of impact that it made. I love the character of Smalls. You know, I, uh, he's a lot different than me. Um, he's a little bit more timid, a little bit more shy, a little bit more scared. Uh, always thinking about, he's the kind of person who thinks before he says things and thinks before he does things, where I tend to not do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I stuck with acting. I've done a lot of films. Uh, through, from the age of 18 to my mid-20s, I did a lot of films. Um, but being an actor, there's never any peace of mind. You know what I mean? You never know when you're going to get your next paycheck. So it's kind of like a roller coaster. It goes up and then it goes down. It goes up and it goes down. So you just kind of ride it out and hopefully get more work. But uh, I love doing it. So I'm, I'm in for the long haul. I'm in for the ride. I just like doing the work. 
but I still have to feed my kids and pay mortgage payments. So I always find something to do to feed my kids and pay the mortgage. Marty, you know, contrary to what Marty is now, because he's a big beast of a guy, uh, he was this little skinny kid, and uh, he had a lot of quirky things, like a funny laugh that he go, hey, 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 you know, and that wasn't in the script, but I used everything I could that, that that came natural for him, you know, and he, he did great. And he loved being his own stunt. Oh my God. My name's Marty York. I played Yeah Yeah. I was cast in the Sandlot back in 1992 after I moved here from uh, Sacramento, California. And uh, I was originally cast as Bertram, so I was cast as another character in the film who was a tall, skinny kid in the movie. They actually came to me during practice when we were practicing baseball, and they said, Hey, you don't really fit the part of Bertram. We want you to reread for this other character called Yeah Yeah. So it was a bigger character in the film. I read this whole script and I was like, all right, yeah. So they said, you need to bring energy to the table. So I remember I walked into the office, the producer, the director, David Mickey Evans was there. He said, uh, they said, you got, you need to bring energy to this. So my mom, I remember my mom gave me a Hershey's bar before I walked in and said, uh, go in there, get some energy, get some sugar in your system. So I walked in the room and by the time I was done with my audition, the director, actually the producer, everyone stood up start clapping and I was like I knew I was yeah yeah at that point what I remember I was stepping on the field was just I mean when you're a kid everything's huge so like I remember seeing this field as a huge field I think the, the coolest thing about stepping on the field was the tree house because that was already built so that tree house that you see in the movie it's that that's part of that was a sound stage when he's telling the story of the beast but the actual tree house in the movie that you see that explodes that was actually filmed right here and they built a two-story no it was about three-story tree house that had poles you could slide down and so I spent all my time up there you know sliding down the poles and it had pulleys and it had all this cool stuff attached to it so that was like one of the funnest parts of uh, doing that. When you come back over the fence uh, after trying to get the ball from the beast and you drop it first of all you, you blew it and you had it in your hands you dropped it but anyway then you do the the lips thing was that a, a bad lip? Yeah what was the decision was that in the script or did you just do that? That wasn't in the script. That actually, I used to watch Bugs Bunny cartoons when I was a kid. And every time, you know, Bugs Bunny would run away, he'd go, blah, 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 blah. so I, I threw that in there, and David was like, what was that? That's not in the script. And I said, he said, but I like it. And uh, ended up being in the movie. It was hilarious. Um, Bertram, he was gung-ho the whole time. Grant was so good. And uh, he was one of those kids that the character didn't have too many lines, but we just found things for him to say. Uh, uh, and I just throw it as the camera's rolling, throw it at him, and he just he'd feed it back really great. Great. He was a stand-up guy. They're all stand-up. What I really remember was not being cast in the movie. <laughs> I auditioned for the role of Smalls, and then didn't hear anything back for months and months and months. Then I got a call to come in and reread for Bertram, and within three days I was cast in on a plane to Salt Lake City. So I remember not getting it, and then showing up here. Yeah, the movie's really special, man. It's a big part of American pop culture. Um, what's your relationship? with the character and you know, after 25 years like what, what's your relationship with Bertram you know I think my relationship with Bertram is the fact that without realizing it I am Bertram I think that was part of the magic of the movie is that we are these kids and David the director had characters in mind but he picked the kids not the characters I think so now going back and watching the film as an adult I'm seeing a lot of my own traits in this and like, like re-looking at Bertram so it's pretty interesting to go back and look at it now. What was your uh, favorite part to shoot in this movie? Uh, well, the whole thing was incredible. It was really just like summer camp for all of us, running around on this field all summer long, playing baseball, giving each other a hard time. But I think a uh, favorite scene to film was either the 4th of July sequence being out here under the lights or the uh, carnival sequence uh, celebrating the win against those uh, those terrible Tigers. So my little brother, my little brother when he was about four, uh, we watched the Sandlot so much that we went to church, huh? and the primary teacher in church pulled out a big pack of chewing gum, and at four years old, he said, Cha! In church! And the guy was like, what is going on here? But I promised him I'd tell you. Yeah, bad influence. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> after, I, after I left acting, I'd always had a deep love for music, uh, but was never committed enough to be a musician. So. Being on the business side of music, being able to work with artists, represent artists, help them deliver their creative and bring their vision out into the world has been a really special thing. And I think uh, growing up on the other side of the camera, 
has really allowed me to connect with artists uh, in a way that I probably wouldn't have been able to before. Brandon Adams, Brandon, you know, of all the guys from, from how they were in their personalities when they were kids till they are now, I think Brandon is the one who's changed the least. He was super polite and very cool, very, you know, easy going man and I've hung around with him in the last few years on these tours the dude is still totally cool and really easy going you know he's got a great sense of humor my name is Brandon Adams and I play Kenny DeNunez I was one of the last ones cast um, I don't think it was too many other guys up for my part man so I kind of I kind of had an easy way up in there but uh, then they took us all and put us together they had different groups of guys just to see how they meshed together and uh, turned out to be us. I didn't do too much uh, pitching after the film, man, but it was it was cool just learning about that position, you know what I mean, and training to do that every day, the regiment that I had to do, because I was no pitcher, bro, but you know, they, they put me in there, I uh, almost broke a couple cameras, but you know, I came out all right. We did a whole baseball training camp. Then we came up here, man, and we just took, we just took the field, I just took the mound, man, and it was just all, it was all fun, no work, you know? And I mean, De Nunez, you know, it's a part that I play, but I feel like every part that you do play is a little part of you too. And uh, that's definitely something that I'm carrying with me even 25 years later, you know, people love the movie. I'm glad to see that it's transcending generations, you know, from one on down to the next. And uh, man, I'm just, I feel blessed to be a part of it, you know? This particular uh, shot, some of this I think is, uh... This photo, well, it wasn't Photoshop, didn't have that at the time, but uh, um, compiled, if you will. Um, but it looks really good. It always did look good. And uh, I mean, I really liked it. I mean, I, the marketing department at Fox is, I've worked for every studio in Hollywood, and, and they really do have, if not the best, one of the best marketing departments. And they, they mocked this up for me. And I loved it because, you know, he is the neighborhood legend, you know, and these are all his buddies, and they're all holding him up. <clears throat> and uh, even though he, these are the two, heroes or protagonists of the movie i mean this is the guy that becomes the legend sort of you know like babe ruth was the legend so i, I like this a lot um the original theatrical motion picture in the theater's uh poster was different <clears throat> it was just a blue background that said the sandlot had a big baseball bat and all the kids hands holding the baseball bat remember doing that when you were a kid right and then the last hand on the top is the beast paw that is, to my, in my mind, one of the best movie posters in the history of mankind. But this one really resonates with people because that's all the guys that people love about this film. I mean, that, you know, it, it was smart, simple, no brainer, put them all on the, on the thing and they're all cheering and laughing and, you know, it just tells you, you're gonna watch this movie, you're gonna have a good time, come away feeling good, you know? It has been great being back here, but I gotta be honest, there's one thing that's, uh kind of ruining the moment for me. I don't know if you guys know, but there's a certain someone that uh, was here 25 years ago. He wasn't invited then, and he's not invited now. Uh, you might go by the name of... Do you want to say it? Oh, no. Yeah, you might go by the name of Phillips. Where are you, tough guy? Are you scared? Oh, I see how it is. What's going on? I haven't seen you in 25 years. You look good, man. Thank you. Really? Have you, been, have you been working out? A little bit. Yeah. Maybe three days a week. What about you? God, it's so good. Let's hug this out. I love you. Hey! hey. Nice Phillips, you. everybody! Hey. Good to see you guys. Will Hornuff as Phillips? Yeah, I remember Will. He, uh, he came in and just killed it, you know? I didn't have to tell him much of anything. Will was a, a sweet kid, and he really got into into that cuss out. My name is Will Horniff, and I played the uh, the bully, the leader of the the rich team Phillips in the Sandlot. One of the films I never actually auditioned for. I actually got the part in another film 
called a far off place that they went older in the roles. And so kind of like as a consolation, they said, hey, you wanna, you wanna do this film called The Sandlot? And I was like, sure. Uh, little did, did I know it turned out to be a classic film. How long did it take you guys to make that scene? That one iconic scene that everyone knows every word to? About a week. Yeah, yeah, it took us a week. We were cracking each one. other up. <laughs> no, you know, what's funny about that scene is uh, originally it was written for Benny. Uh, really? He was supposed to face off with Will, with Phillips, but I think because we had already filmed the movie, we were already about probably halfway through or something. Benny sort of became this legend already, and he was like, you know, the hero. So I don't think the director wanted the hero to say butt sniffer, you know? <laughs> so he said, you know who could say butt sniffer? Ham. You know, at that point in my life, I was a, a bit scrawny for my age and small and short, and I, I had my share of bullies. So I just kind of just drew from all the experiences that I had because and everybody had that kind of person in their life, and I just kind of said, hey, let me just do my, the best job kind of uh, imitating that. And I just went out there and just did, you know, I guess my, I kind of drew from all my own experiences, being a short, scrawny kid and having like that bully guy come up to you and trash talk you and give you problems. And uh, it was just a blast coming out there and doing that. I was about 12 years old, I think. And I remember coming here and seeing this this field that you just see nothing and you walk down this, this kind of alley and all of a sudden it opens up into this amazing sandlot field and seeing all the guys together joking around. And I remember getting there and, you know, shooting had already been going on for a while and just them kind of being extremely friendly to me, welcoming me, and uh, just kind of felt like part of the team even though I was on the other team. And uh, it was just so great because at that period of time, it was just a great, you know, community and a great sense of community on the set and a great part in history, you know, for all of us. And uh, it was just a real blast seeing the kind of camaraderie everybody had, you know, between the guys on the team and, and even us, the guys on the other team as well. If you could have one prop from the movie, or maybe you guys did take a prop to keep it, but if you could keep one prop, what would it be? Easy, my KC Monarchs hat. That was a baller hat, the yeah, KC I Monarchs. Yeah. I don't know what happened to that hat. That's, that's vintage, that's like $85 right now, if you go and buy that thing. I'm not kidding, that, yeah. the, the vintage look is back, and that would have made a, that, that would have been good. But I wish I could find that one. Yeah. The one you actually yeah. used. Yeah. What about you? I actually got to keep my LA hat, Did you really? uh, and I've got that somewhere. But I think if I could go back, I'd have to keep that bag of Big Chief. <laughs> the best, because it's the best, right? Sure. Sure. Patrick, uh, I'd probably want to find that s'more, the half-eaten s'more, and frame it. Get Tom to sign it. I think I ate it, bro. You ate the whole thing? Pretty sure. Because yeah. they're good, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. When you finally figured it out, yeah. they're really good. They're good. I know. Uh, I kept the uh, harness that I went over the the, uh, the fence with. They lifted me. I actually have that at my mom's house. It's a fiberglass harness. For real? That's I, terrific. I have that, yeah. Thanks. What prop for you, Chauncey? Uh, my glasses. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have them, and I need to. <laughs> I have them. You have the glasses? Yeah, I stole them. So I did. And I'm not giving them back. Oh, wow. Okay. Class action. They're not worth $85. They're no. worth, like... $85,000. I meant the you know. All right. Uh, Victor. Oh, I kept uh, one of the vacuum cleaners that, that blew up. From the, uh, from the great uh, the great vacuum cleaner explosion in 93. You remember that? 1993. Right over uh, here, right over here. <laughs> no, no I, I wish I would have kept my glove. It was a cool, it was like a vintage, you know, 60s era glove, and I wish I would have kept that. How about you, Shane? Uh, I actually, I wish I could have kept some of the clothes, not because I could still wear them, but just, everyone asks us about the clothes, the, the costumes we wore back then. So having some of those would be really cool. I actually do have some of the leaves from the tree that the treehouse was in. They're in my kitchen. So those are pretty cool. Tom? I want my trout cap back. <laughs> it's in the Louisville Slugger Museum. I want it back. I think we're all going to dress in black and break into the Louisville Slugger Museum. The Sandlot 4. The Sandlot 4. We're going to steal back the trap cap. I need it. Mission Impossible 7 for years. That's what's going to happen. Will? I want my bike. The Schwinn's. I want my bike. That'd be great. Well, you know, I met someone the other day that said they own your bike. Like, really? Yeah, they actually they bought it and they have it. What a cool thing to own. That's awesome. We messed up. We didn't steal enough stuff from the set. Damn. Pat Renna. Pat was my go-to guy. Pat, um, 
like I think I said in the interview, uh, that, that, that scene when he's catching against the Little League players and he's, he's you know, razzing them all with that stuff from behind the plate, that's all ad lib. I would think that up as the camera's rolling and fire it at him and he'd fire it right back. You know, anytime I had a, an issue like, oh man, I don't know, I got a piece of trouble, I don't know what to do, I just said, uh, bring me Pat, you know, and he was my go-to guy. My name's Patrick Renna and I played Hamilton Porter in The Sandlot. When I got cast in the movie, Everyone else had actually already been cast. I was the last one, uh, or the second to last, one of the last. But I, uh, it was so fast because they were ready to shoot. So I just had one audition with the director. And then the next day, I got a call saying he wants me to meet all the other guys. So, uh, you know, they kind of said, don't think that you have it because you don't yet. But uh, he really, you know, as long as you get along with all the other guys, then the job's yours. So. I had to, you know, muscle them into being nice to me, you know. I guess I feel like everyone's got a little ham in them, right? So uh, I think even myself, I have a, a little of that ham character in me, the loud mouth, the, you know, show off or whatever, you know. The first scene that we shot was the pickle scene at school. Uh, so that, I remember that scene very well, but I don't really remember the first time coming on the Sandlot, probably because we spent so much time on the Sandlot that it's all a bit of a blur, you know. There's not like one moment, but I do remember coming back 25 years later, and that's that's pretty awesome. Squigs, can I take a picture of you? Yes, you can, buddy. Come on up. All right, we have one super fan here that has a question. We need Will uh, Curtis Helmick to come up here. I've, told, I've been told Curtis is here. This question is actually for my girlfriend, Leslie. I love you more than words can say right now. Aww. Leslie, will you marry me? That's a yes. I've probably seen more fan, uh, Sandlot fan art than anybody in the world. And I mean, everything from people getting uh, uh, squints when he's grinning tattoos, you know. Uh, another guy had a Bambino one. Guy just sent me one the other day on Facebook where he got heroes get remembered but legends never die on his, on his forearm, you know. It never ends, man. It's just, uh, it's a phenomenon. I could not be more grateful. Yeah, this one I'm just putting my name on. I don't want to mess it up, dude. The Sandlot's been called a lot of things, and this is not me talking. This is just, you know, Sports Illustrated, Bleacher Seats. I mean, you name it. Um, uh, the relate great Roger Ebert. Um, the greatest baseball movie ever made, it's been called. It's been called the, the best summer movie of all time. And another one that I only recently found out about, it was voted, not sure where this was, but it, it was a big deal, the most American movie ever made. Not the best movie ever made in America, the best American movie ever made. Uh, just that it reflects, to, to, to have that, somebody say that is kind of astounding, you know? Because, you know, America, there's, there's, there's what America means and then there's what America means to everybody and everybody individually. So what is that? Opportunity, um, you know, the Sandlot's from a simpler time. There was good and bad, whatnot. Um, but that it's, dude, that if that ever got into the theaters, I couldn't believe it. And then everything after that was gravy, you know. And uh, it, it blew through the uh, VHS days, and then into, it just blew up even bigger the DVD days. And now on streaming and all that, and now I get to get to make a prequel to it. Uh, it takes place in 1950. It's a it's certainly its own little franchise, but there's never any way to know that when you're doing it. You know, I made this movie for me, you know, and it turns out, for whatever reason, and I don't question it, if I like it, it seems like other people, you know, whatever I do, whatever I write, whatever, if I end up liking it, it seems like other people end up liking it. So I'm blessed that way. 
uh, but that it's endured and that it means so much to so many people. I've been told thousands and thousands of times. There's one lady in Arkansas at a AAA park when, uh, during the 20th anniversary. She had her three boys with her. They were probably like 12, 9, and 7, something like that, you know, young, young guys. They all had the baseball mitts and their baseball mitts and stuff. And she was almost in tears, and she said, I waited a long time to tell you this and signed all their stuff. And she says, it's not just a movie. And I'm saying, okay. I get a lot of this, Mr. Evans, you don't understand. <laughs> I was like, okay, what don't I understand? Right? And she says, it's not just a movie. My, my kids grew up with them, the characters, and the characters are like their brothers that taught them all the good lessons they needed to know. I don't know. I don't know what other directors or writers get, but I can't imagine anything better than that. You know? Working with David was fantastic, and he had a lot on his plate when we were making this film. Um, I know even... Personally, I never knew, but his, uh, his newborn was very sick, and he had to fly back and forth from California to Utah while we're doing it. And then he's trying to wrangle nine kids, you know, nine 11-year-old kids. Uh, it was just a lot, you know, directing the film and trying to juggle everything. And he knocked it out of the park, man. I mean, he did a great job. He's a very talented writer, a very patient guy. Um, and he works so well. I mean, even as a kid, even being my first movie, he worked really well, and it's it, if you get a director that can work well with actors, it's it's fantastic. Um, and he, 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 as a as a child actor, it's you know it's hard. Sometimes it can get hard for, as a director to, to get what you want out of the child actor. You know, what I mean? but he he was able to do it, and he was able to explain it and talk to you. I just think he was probably one of the most talented guys around. He's a genius, and you know we obviously. The cast has a little bit to do with it, and we did a good job, but he really has the most, he can, uh, you know, share in the most accolades for it, because this is his movie, and he's the man, and, you know, just even talking to him, and he's a genius, and he's brilliant, and he uh, he really captured, he captured something special that means a lot to people, so that's awesome. When Walt Disney built Disneyland, everybody in the world wanted to go there, okay? And people think he was born and raised in Marceline, Missouri, and he wasn't. He only lived there for a very short time during his childhood. And it was uh, this little Main Street, you know, town, early 1900s, all that. He lived on a farm and all that sort of thing. When he built Disneyland, he built Main Street, USA. And there's a lot of influences from that little town's Main Street. And somebody was walking with him, some big dignitary from another country. I can't remember who it was. And he says, well, Mr. Disney as he's looking, you know, at the shops and the, you know, the architecture from the early 1900s, and he said, you, you, you got it, this is just the way it was. And, and Disney said, no, it's not. It's the way it should have been. And for me, that's the Sandlot, and it'll always mean that to me, is that's not the way my childhood was, dude. My childhood was really, really bad and rough, you know? But I, you know, look, as an artist, um, I think you'll agree, we have a time machine. You know, whether that's a piece of paper and a pencil or a computer or whatever, um, I can change history, and I did, and I did it for the better. You know, I'm not saying I, I don't want to remember my childhood. I remember every second of it. I wish it had been uh, different, and I got the great blessing and the great opportunity to go actually remake it, you know? So it'll always mean that to me. There you go, dude. All truth.